Okay, it's Wednesday. It's Trump week. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're going to talk about Trump. We're going to try to connect the dots. Uh, Tim Apatella and me. Good morning, Tim. Hey, good morning, Jay. Yet hey, another great this week. This has really been an interesting week. Um, you know, we predicted this. Our job is to connect the dots. We saw the, uh, it was, gee, it was two weeks ago now, uh, we saw the acquittal. Uh, and now we're finding out, you know, how that affects him. It's involved in him in every which way. Uh, we predicted that, that he would attack the press, um, but it looks like that, that has yet to happen. Uh, soon enough, he's going to be attacking the press, too. But at the moment, he's attacking his, his own government. He's attacking the, the, uh, the Justice Department. Um, and he's, uh, he, he's doing this uh, trick to show who's boss um, by partnering all these people. Uh, so what you have is, aside from the individual events, the individual actions the president is taking, um, what you have is, is a larger picture. And the larger picture, which we uh, should draw during this program, is that he's now emboldened. He's going to show you who's boss. Let's talk about the pardons. What did he do? And if you can, why? Well, I think the statement that uh, he put out, I believe it was this morning, uh, he proclaimed himself top cop. He's the top cop in the nation. Well, I always thought that was the attorney general. I didn't know that was going to be the president of the United States. Uh, he's proclaimed himself top at everything. Um, a stable genius. Only I can fix it. And now he's the top cop of the United States of America. So what has he done? He has basically uh, offered so many pardons for white-collar criminals it appears to me that he's trying to normalize white crime, white collar crime. Um, like many things he's tried to normalize. He's tried to normalize lying for over 16,000 lies from Donald Trump. He's tried to normalize kids in cages. He's tried to normalize um, hate speech groups. Um, he's tried to normalize uh, everything. Now it's white collar crimes and he's trying to let everybody off. And I think I have a reason. I know why he's doing it, but um, it would be a prediction more more so than a fact. What is it? Well, what's the number one thing Donald Trump is really worried about, and especially in case he doesn't get reelected? Uh, there's a little place called the Southern District of Manhattan, somewhere in the New York area. Uh, and I think he's scared to death that someday they're going to file charges against him once he's out of office, once he's no longer president of the United States. And I think he's trying to normalize white collar crime, the things that he's been, would be indicted for. And um, why would I be indicted if it's normalized? That's just my theory at this point. But you know, that wouldn't come true for either four years or in the next 12 months after he's out of office. So who knows how this is gonna go? Yeah, well, you know, but you misspoke a minute ago to say white, uh, white collar crime. And uh, funny that uh, none of the, uh, not that I know of anyway, none of the pardons have been anybody but white um, and his friends. And let me offer another thought here, and that is that he's trying to normalize Roger Stone. He's setting the stage for Roger Stone, which is going to come Thursday. And he doesn't want to do Roger Stone, you know, in a, as a one-shot, one-pardon range, but he wants to do Roger Stone in a bunch of, in a bunch of pardons. And so this is the way he sets the stage and tries to normalize it for the benefit of Roger Stone. And my guess is that he will do exactly that because it is an outrage and because he feeds on outrages. He wants to outrage everyone, so he keeps on doing it. And the outrage is, uh, is really made complete by the fact that, what is it, a, 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 1100, first 1,100 prosecutors um, complained, and uh, most of them, no, 1,100 prosecutors uh, signed a letter, wasn't it? Better, yeah. and, and now it's double that double the number of prosecutors have signed that letter uh, complaining about what he's doing and the pardons and his way of treating the Justice Department. Uh, William Barr, who I don't believe ever, uh, said that if uh, this makes it so hard for uh, Trump, uh, so hard for Barr to, um, you know, do his job, that he, he may resign. I don't think he's going to resign. I think it's just drama, sort of uh, the kind of drama you'd see in a reality show. Um, suffice to say, I think he's setting the stage. I kind of agree with you. He's setting the stage for more of this going forward to pay off his friends. 
even when they get prosecuted. All of his friends that got prosecuted are going to get pardoned one by one or groups by groups. And it's because he's untouchable now. Uh, he, he believes, and probably rightly so, that the Democrats could never mount another impeachment proceeding. It's too close to the one that happened. Um, and he can paste it as just another, you know, witch hunt and all that. So <clears throat> bottom line is uh, from now till the end of his term, hopefully that will be in November or at the, at the end of the year, January 19th, January 20th, um, he is going to do this kind of thing. Uh, and we're going to see more and more of it because he's been exonerated in, in the impeachment trial. There won't be another impeachment trial. I think that's clear. And so he's taking advantage of that. Um, and he's going to do, my prediction is that he's going to do more and more of this going forward. It'll be outrageous, outrage upon outrage, as, as you can imagine. In fact, things you can't imagine. And it's not only going to be domestic, it's going to be international. And furthermore, he's not going to do the right thing, only the wrong thing. You know, he hasn't done anything about the, about the virus. Uh, this is a leader of the free world. This is the, this is the United States of America. Uh, this is, these are the people who thought up the Marshall Plan after the war. These are the people who are charitable and kind. Um, but we're not doing that. We're not stepping out. We're not stepping forward. We're not really helping anybody uh, to beat the virus. He's busy. He's busy exonerating people. He's busy reveling in his, uh, uh, his own acquittal. So I think what we have here is a pattern. We're going to see again and again because he's doing it because he, he can do it. What else is he doing, Tim? Can you identify any of the other things? This week. Well, let's talk about where this is coming from. I, I think it's all his friends and friends and buddies in Mar-a-Lago. Um, they have the presidents here. Um, you know, we have Milken, Michael Milken. He's been um, he's been given a, an acquittal. And where did that come from? Out of left field. So he's taking the advice of friends and family, um, Roger Ailes and, and, and company. And he's, again, he's letting everyone off of the pass. And he's trying to normalize it, just like we've been talking about. Now, where's this going to ultimately get him? I don't know. If, if, if this is a message for the judge on the Roger Stone case, I don't think he's helping Roger Stone. But maybe he's trying to send a message to the judge that, look, I don't care if you give Roger Stone 10 years or 15 years or, or 8 years. I'm going to basically going to find a pardon for him within the next 12 months. Maybe that's the message he's trying to send. I don't know. Bottom line is, um, what does the voter think about this? Is he trying to nor I feel like sometimes he's trying to convert the country into his own little Gotham City, uh, where, where corruption is normalized and accepted, and people just don't question it any further. They just accept it as a reality. And I really do get the sense that I'm watching a, a, a Batman movie here, and Donald Trump is the Joker. Oh, well, yeah. And, you know, right now his polls are up. Again, the more outrageous things he does, the higher his polls go. I can't believe him. Um, I think it's 49 his and 51 against him. But that's pretty close. And that does not give you, uh, you know, a, 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 an optimistic feeling about the election going forward. A lot of people in this country like him. I, I don't understand why. He hasn't really done anything for them. And, and he has threatened them, uh, you know, with, uh, with uh, cutting the budget on uh, Social Security. That's awful. And it's going to hurt all the people who rely on Social Security. And there's millions and millions and millions of them. And Medicare, same thing. And Medicaid, same thing. <laughs> so, you know, what you have here is he's, he's putting their heads right in it, and they still support him. It's madness. It's Jim Jones and Jonestown. It's a cult thing. Um, and, you know, there was a thing on uh, M uh, MSNBC last night where uh, one of the senior editorial reporter, a woman, said, you know, this, this, this it's going to catch up with him. Uh, he, he can't uh, he can't avoid you know uh, some kind of consequences for what he's doing. But then one of the others, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, formerly in the uh, Obama White House, I think, he disagreed. He said, no, no, he, he can get away with this. He is getting away with this, um, and it's not at all clear it's going to catch up with him because the more time that passes, the more judges will be judges that he appointed, um, and it's the new normal, and it's the new reality, and it's the new alternative facts and all that, and people don't understand it. All those people in the red states who support him, uh, all those right-wing conservatives, lots of them, they give him money, they support him, and they don't understand that he's coming for them. It's the ghost of Christmas future. 
they don't understand that it's going to affect them, that a cut in Social Security is going to affect them. And I, and I think people walk around saying, it's okay, it's all right, it's not going to affect me. But it is. So let's, let's talk about that. That's the incredible part. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, his voters in some of the rest states, I assume that some of his voters are blue collar workers. And, you know, a lot of them are at an age where, you know, their bodies have been working all their lives and, and you know, they're getting in their late 50s or 60s. And, um, you know, a lot of them, because of their, you know, they've been working in, in, in physical labor jobs, their body, bodies are worn out. What is uh, going to be cut in the, in the proposed 2020 budget? Uh, a lot of money off the Social Security disability. Now, I can see a lot of Trump voters who are still working, but their bodies are worn out, actually probably would qualify under current guidelines for Social Security disability. Well, guess what? He's going to cut out probably about uh, about 900 some odd billion dollars out of this program. And um, won't that be good for those folks that actually need it and have the ability to apply for it and there'd be a chance that they could actually be granted Social Security disability. Not under the 2020, 2021 budget, it won't. I don't understand. You know, back when, back a couple of years ago, when uh, people began to state their position on the issue, uh, a certain number of people that I know, uh, you know, said they, were, they supported Trump. It haven't changed. I don't think I know anybody who was supporting Trump who said, I'm stopping. I'm not going to support him anymore. You know, these things he's done... Make it impossible for me to say. I don't know anybody who's actually changed. In fact, I think they're probably under the hood. There are a lot of people who've changed to support him. Even though he hasn't done anything for the country, everything he's done overseas has is, is been a mistake and a danger. I mean, I hear, for example, there were, you know, a couple of months ago, there were, there were a couple of roadside bombs killed Americans. And so he attacked. Remember that? He attacked and he blue planes and bombs and all this, and you can't kill our people like that. Okay, then we have, fast forward till now, um, we have these uh, ostensible um, negotiations, peace negotiations, make a deal with the, uh, with the Taliban um, in Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really strange because it was only uh, several weeks ago where he said, I'm never going to, I'm never going to make a deal with those people. They keep on killing our soldiers. So the, these negotiations are going on right now, and two Americans are killed. And he says, well, okay, two Americans are killed, but I'm still going on with the negotiations. The change in position, it depends on what he had for a hamburger that morning, is, is quite extraordinary. And he's making mistake after mistake in terms of dealing with the Middle East. I, I can't tell you anything he's done right. We're dealing with Europe, we're dealing with the EU, we're dealing with China, we're dealing with North Korea, and so on and so forth. We can spend the whole show just talking about his international mistakes, how he's, he's lost it for the United States. But uh, if you people that, they still like him. Okay, so here we go. We're, we're in tonight. In fact, it may be happening very soon, a matter of hours. We're going to see the, the Democratic uh, debate that will, for the first time, include Michael Bloomberg. Uh, very important because, you know, it's clear, I think it's clear to everybody, that Bloomberg, maybe beyond all the others, can actually face Trump down. He's been around the block. Uh, he knows the score. He's been the mayor of New York, which isn't easy. Um, and he can face him down. He can answer him, you know, shot for shot. Two New Yorkers going at it, you know. <laughs> That'd be all right. But, but the Democrats continue to shoot at each other. They take snipes at each other all day long. They can't help themselves. And they are busting their own shops, shooting themselves in the foot. I'm really curious to see how this debate goes tonight. Uh, what, where are we, Tim, and what do you think is going to happen? Well, it is a circular, a circular firing squad, and I even see the media trying to um, discount Michael Bloomberg. I, I think that Michael Bloomberg actually has a lot of appeal for those voters who are dis disenchanted with Donald Trump, um, particularly some of his past policies, policies in New York. It's kind of right up their alley, like the stop and frisk policies. You know, that's something that Donald Trump would do, and, and they kind of like that kind of stuff. So Michael Bloomberg actually does have some appeal for disenchanted uh, Trump voters. I also think that Michael uh, Bloomberg has appeal for the fact that he used to be a Republican. Remember that? And uh, though he's a Democrat now, but people remember him as a Republican. So he has a lot of things that, um, you know, he's not a progressive. Uh, they like that fact. And he, 
Michael Bloomberg may be that centrist of a candidate that Democrats are going to kind of have to be forced to go along with because they don't want Donald Trump to be a second term president. But also, he may be middle of the road centrist enough for Republicans and the independents to say, OK, I can swallow his medicine. I can go with this guy. So um, that is a real threat to every candidate right now. Um, and he's got the money and the resources to pull this off. He also has the hooks enough to stand up to Donald Trump, not be intimidated, and throw it back in his face. So uh, we'll see how this goes tonight. And I think he's going to probably do fairly well. I hope so. You know, I've noticed, uh, I read the Washington Post every day. I've noticed that the Post has really let go on um, Michael Bloomberg. They've been criticizing him and, and uh, you know, putting negative stuff on him every day. In fact, I think it was the headline, um, the Post, maybe the Times, uh, went into a, a, a book that uh, was created about uh, Michael Bloomberg years ago, decades ago, uh, where he... He makes these, um, you know, remarks, and he's a, a expletive not deleted, you know, uh, remarks in the course of his business to his uh, um, the people of employees around him. But you know what strikes me is uh, there's no there's no rape charge, there's no claim that he violated the law. Uh, there are Supreme Court judges that have been up on their employees or have used the, uh, you know, uh, expletive deleted phraseology. Um, and they got on the Supreme Court with consent. Um, so you know, I don't know what the big deal is. And, and so what you get in the Washington Post anyway, article after article about how Bloomberg is a hard-nosed guy and he doesn't treat his people all that well. So what? Is that, is that a reason to disqualify him? What I don't understand is why the Democratic you know, institutions are attacking him this way. They attack him for his money. They attack him for his choice of words. Uh, they attack him on every level they can. Why is that when he is, in fact, as you say, a pretty viable candidate? And they attack him for spending the money. I can't believe it. Trump, Trump was claiming he didn't need any contributions in, in 2016. But now he's claiming that, uh, that uh, Michael Bloomberg is, is, uh, is running on his own funds. Uh, he, he, I guess he's changed his view in that regard. So I guess if everybody is complaining about Bloomberg, uh, then that means Bloomberg must be a real threat to everybody, to the Democrat candidates that are running with him and, and, and to Trump himself. I guess it, it's a good thing to be criticized because it means they care about you. Um, query, will the people care about Michael Bloomberg? Will, will all these complaints have a negative effect on, on his candidacy? Uh, I, I hope not, because I think he could win. And I don't think that Bernie Sanders can win. It's nice to know all the young people, uh, you know, support his uh, his, his left-wing uh, democratic positions, um, but I don't think that's going to get. I don't think that's going to win an election where you have 49 against 51 percent. Um, and Trump and Trump isn't done with dirty tricks. Trump is not done with dirty tricks. And some of these articles, some of these threads you see on social media and the like against Bloomberg, I think originated with Trump and Mr. Putin. That's what I think. Uh, so what we have here is, uh, you know, we're, we're already uh, close to the ninth inning. Uh, we're seeing this unfold. We're seeing it shake out, so to speak. A lot of a lot of Democratic candidates are going, going away or will go away. And at the end, it's going to be, what, Sanders? And um, I don't think Biden, actually. Uh, and hopefully Michael uh, Bloomberg and uh, who else? How is it going to how is it going to unfold? Do you have a prediction? Yeah, I do have a prediction, and the prediction is very simple. If Bernie Sanders is the Democratic nominee, Donald Trump will have a second term. That's one prediction. Number two is Bloomberg is an outsider. Bloomberg has made some enemies. And as Winston Churchill best said it is, if you've got enemies, that's good, because that means you've stood up at some point against someone. And uh, having enemies isn't necessarily a bad thing. And I think he's got a shot at it. Um, Let's not forget about Buddha Judge and, and Klobuchar. But, um, you know, again, they're, I like Klobuchar a lot. I think she, she's a centrist, but I just don't know if she has enough inertia, enough money, enough of, of a, ground, a ground game to get her the nomination and then certainly be a formidable affordable, um, opponent against Donald Trump. So, you know, I see three candidates as, as viable. Um, 
Joe Biden, I wish he was, but he's just losing steam. So we'll, we'll see how he does tonight. Maybe he resurrects his numbers. Maybe he res resurrects some of his um, support and followers. And we'll see what happens after tonight. We'll certainly know if, whether he's in or out by Super Tuesday. So, you know, stay tuned as they, you know, news at 11, as they say. Yeah, well, we have a few minutes left. I want to return um, to the underscore point here where we started. And that is the demise of the Justice Department, the demise of the uh, federal judiciary, uh, and thus the demise of the country. Uh, you know, if you connected the dots with a chart, a schematic on the wall about all the things that Trump has said and actually done, like 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 a pointing bar um, to you know pull a rug out from under the federal um, judicial system uh, and and the Attorney General of the federal justice system, if you will, is extraordinary. He's really made huge strides in that way, and he's done huge, profound damage to, to the justice system in this country. And to say nothing of the damage he's done to Congress and how Congress is, you know, has been completely castrated, uh, you know, in doing anything for all this time. Uh, the, you know, the government is falling away, and Trump in declaring himself the chief law enforcement officer, is telling us that he wants to be dictator, like these other guys, like Putin, you know, like Kim Jong-un, like uh, Xi Jinping and others. Uh, we, we live in a time when dictators have a chance, and Trump is taking that. But what really, really troubles me is we spent 200 years plus in building this system, in refining this system, in putting a you know, moral, moral overlay on this system that it works for everybody, just as the founders wanted it to. The country's built on that, and Trump is pulling the wings out of all of that every day. It's like we, we really need to stop him. Um, that's why I was so happy to see those, uh, those former prosecutors send the letter. Uh, that's why I was really happy to see the federal judges have a conference call. I think that was scheduled for today about what to do uh, with, with, a, with a president who who does command and influence not only in the military, that was improper, um, but, but with, with the federal judiciary, calling the judges' names, telling them what to do, telling them to protect his friends. Somebody said it's out of a banana republic. It really is out of a banana republic. And he's ripping apart you know, the basic structures of our country, the things that people must be confident in for our society to continue. This is so critically important and so critically dangerous. I hope the people in the red states understand that whatever happens, if their particular silos are improved or not, you know, whether they really understand or not, you can't help but understanding the country is changing for the worse. The Constitution is being essentially ripped up. Um, and I can't tell you how strongly I feel about that. A lot of people I know, but we all seem so powerless to actually stop him. The only way to stop him is with a big election against him. Um, and the problem is he's going to cheat on that election. I am not optimistic about anything right now. How about you? Yeah, I am optimistic. And the reason being is because people have recognized how far we've gone in three years, how far the Constitution, the rule of law, has been stripped to its nth degree. And I think there are people who are now engaged, even though they don't talk about it all the time. Folks are going to talk to their friends. They're going to talk to their family. They're going to talk to the folks who have never voted before or not registered to vote. There's going to be an effort. And I'm hopeful that that's going to win the days, particularly in the swing states. Um, but let me just address one thing you said, Jay, as you, you know, he tries to normalize bad behavior, bad policies, the rule of law, as you said, castrate Congress. Should we be surprised when he could elevate a war criminal by the name of Edward Gallagher, the Navy SEAL, um, that committed and convicted for war crimes, and he elevated him and tried to promote him as a hero? If he could do that to a, an Edward Gallagher, why is it funny for us, or why why is it not unique that he's trying to elevate criminals that have you know that haven't served their terms and he's given all sorts of pardons out? He is again trying to normalize that which we don't want normalized. And um, I think people are fed up with it, and I, I am hopeful for the election. We just okay. get to get the right candidate. The way to stop him short of an election 
with all these bad acts, even in cheating in the election, okay, is to have proceedings going against them, court cases. That means testimony. It means evidence. It means standing up and being courageous, uh, like uh, Lieutenant Commander Vindman. But what he wants to tell us uh, by, you know, essentially uh, uh, retaliating against anybody he can find who testified against him is, you testify against me, you take action against me, and I'll find a way to get you. Um, and that really that dampens the possibility of stopping him. How else can you stop him but legal action? Um, you can't come out with pitchforks in the street. Uh, and the vote may be, this may be a set-up election, you know, with him and his, his friends in Russia. Uh, so what, what can we do is the problem. And Vindman stands there as a, as a 10-foot um, sign to everyone you want, to, you want to testify? You want to go against the president? Even if you're fully entitled, it's not required to testify, he's going to get you. So what are our options? You have one minute. Well, our options were the same options in 1776. That is, those farmers who, you know, were loyal subjects of the, of the crown, King George III, why, what made them? What made them and what motivated them to put everything on the line, risk everything, their farms, their livelihoods, their families, the livelihoods of their, their, their wives and, and children? What made them get up and, and grab, a, you know, grab a musket? And I'll tell you, it was one thing, because they're, they're, they were being oppressed. They were being severely oppressed, and they weren't given allowed uh, a platform for grievances. And we are putting our, finding ourselves very closely to those days. Uh, you don't, you don't want to pick up the market, market, I hope. Yes, but I, I think they're going to pick up the ballots. You don't want to suggest violence. No, I, no, I, I just said, you no. Know, he offers a perfect opportunity for him. Hang on, Jay. Hang on, Jay. Rather, I think that what we have to do is we have to take the Vindman case and we have to not be intimidated. None of us can be intimidated. We have to write. We have to have this program. We have to testify. We have to, you know, initiate civil actions. We have to cause our officials to initiate civil actions. We have to do this many, many, many times. And in that way, it'll be clear in the press. I know he's going to attack the press, but in the press and among everyone you know that we that courage counts, and courage to speak out counts. Courage to call him out on this. That's what counts. That's what we can do. Let me clarify something, Jay. I want to make sure I get this out before the show's over. I, I said it's important not to pick up a musket. It's important to go to the ballot box. And that's how the democracy works. That's how we preserve the republic. And that's what I hope happens in 2020 election. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Jay. We're getting, we're getting to do this. We're getting better at this. What can I say? Okay. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Trump Week. We'll see you next week. There'll be more. Aloha. Aloha.